You are now tuned in to Believe. Do you believe? This is the East Side Liquor Halftime Podcast. Oh, intermission. No, it's halftime. Stop by 9390 Rogers Avenue for the best liquor, beer, and wine deals in the River Valley. Arkansas wins the national championship! Check out East Side Liquor on Facebook for weekly specials. Say goodbye! Darren McFadden, 80 yards, touchdown! Subscribe to the Hit That Line Podcast Network, brought to you by Breeden RV Center. Breeden RV Center, family owned and operated, a no pressure, laid back atmosphere, and always home of the free maintenance for life. Back to practice today for Arkansas football. They'll be putting on the pads for the first time here in preseason camp. Still resisting calling it fall camp, which is what it is listed as, titled as uh, fall camp on the preseason media availability. Uh, sheet that was sent out by the athletic department earlier this month. Yeah, preseason camp really starts to get to hitting today with full pads. A couple of days in front of the first of two closed scrimmages in Sam Pittman's third year. So pretty big day. Practice will get started at 2.50. And then later on this afternoon, Sam Pittman will speak to the media. So we'll have a lot of sound to play for that tomorrow. Men's basketball back in action again, this time in Barcelona against the, I guess it's called the All-Stars, the Toto Estrella, I think in Spanish. It seems that that would translate into All-Stars. I know Estrella is star. Toto feels like all. Is this what I want it to be? Something like that? Your guess is as good as mine. Playing at the at La Pavelo Polisportu Municipal de Tiana. Mm. We just continue to learn our... Spanish words for arena, or in this case, pavilion for Pavello. And after a blowout of Valencia Selección two days ago, we'll see if Barcelona is any uh, more of a, of a, a strong opponent. Uh, and we'll also see if the team is going to be... Well, I, I don't know Barcelona is not... I don't know my Spanish geography incredibly well, but if before even pulling up a map, I don't think Barcelona is on the coast. I think Valencia is, and that's why they were able to do a whole preseason thing in the ocean or on the beach and everything. Kind of wonder what they'll be doing for pregame today. I think what I read is instead of frolicking in the ocean and running sets on the beach, which is just an amazing thing to think about on a game day for a, a basketball team that once they get into the season is, is, is certainly not going to be playing around on the beach or really messing around all that much on a game day. Uh, maybe visiting some some museums today, or you know, checking out the architecture in Barcelona uh, before you get your pregame meal, and then it all turns into business. It, it becomes obvious though when you watch the highlights, or if you did watch uh, Tuesday's Flow Sports telecast, uh, that down to business for this basketball team just looks like a heck of a lot of fun. Not everybody has fun when it comes to doing business. Sometimes it feels like work, but uh, I think work feels like fun for this team, and they certainly put on a highlight display against La Selección. We'll see if it happens today at 1.30 against the mm. Toto Estrellas. And you get NFL preseason getting underway tonight. We'll have the pro debut of Traylon Burks, the Titans, and the Ravens. No one will be able to watch it. Well, I get you Unless know that- you get NFL Plus. Like, I-, I literally spent an hour this morning, Phil, trying to figure out how to watch this for free. Drew is our resident Ravens fan. So yes. I mean, these are this would be one of the games that is just a local telecast well, I've on even, the Nashville over-the-air network that has mm-hmm. the preseason contract for the Titans and the same for Baltimore, but it's not a national telecast. Well, see, NFL I even, Network is showing Giants and Patriots. They're not showing Titans and Ravens, but there is a plus, like there's an NFL streaming service in this case? Yes, there is NFL Plus, which is a way that... Um, I, I don't know how long, how old it is. This might be the first year, might be the second um, of ways to watch out-of-market games. It's a, obviously a paid uh, subscription. But, Phil, I even tried to, you know, go kind of through the back door a little bit with it by using uh, TV logins of a buddy of mine's parents who live in the Nashville area. So I figured if I'm able to use their logins, then I can use basically have their television location and be able to stream their local t- TV, which has worked before in the past. I just haven't been able to figure it out just yet, but I- I'm working on it. 
Or you I sound like a lot of you sound like a lot of Arkansas basketball fans trying to figure out mm-hmm. how they can watch the Flow Sports telecast without paying for it. Yeah, if anybody's got an NFL Plus account out there, just text it to us eight seven seven three seven seven. Yeah, we'll put it out there on the broadcast. Not and just for let everybody, everybody just, log for, in just for me, just for me. I saw about I heard about the Flow Sports thing. How many how many different streams are you allowed or devices are you allowed to watch? I think it was supposed to be in the teens, mm. like sixteen different devices, but yet. Most people that tried it that way, it turned into, wait, well, you can really just watch it on the one account that somebody signed up for with their email address, and that was it. So it might be a pretty interesting telecast today. Tomorrow, we have Brett Dolan coming on the show. He did the play-by-play along with Matt Zimmerman for Flow Sports on Tuesday. I know Dolan's not available today because mm. he's doing a Major League Baseball game in Houston, which is, you know, another one of the things that Brett does. So uh, who is it? I was texting with Z earlier today. And he said that the play-by-play guy is Spencer Turkin. This will be interesting because Zim is obviously in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. I think he's doing the broadcast in the same RSN studio room where we did all the road games during the 2020-21 basketball season when we weren't traveling with Mm -hmm. the teams and we were just doing it uh, watching a television broadcast. But, you know, Chuck and Z were sitting next to each other for those games. In this case... Uh, Spencer Turkin is in North Carolina, hmm. so he'll be he'll be far away from Zim. Maybe he'll have to do the same thing you and I do, Drew, which is FaceTime each other so you can do the visual cues. Yeah, you got to. I mean, you got to be able to look at somebody in order to do a great broadcast. Now you can do it without seeing their face, but that that's why you see uh, you'll hear a lot of delays and stuff when you don't have those visual visual cues to do it. Hopefully, game two goes just as well as game one. And I'm not even talking about on the court because obviously the team that they're going to be playing today in Barcelona is is a much better team. I mean, heck, they've got former NBA uh, point guard, backup point guard, but still NBA uh, point guard Nick Kalaitis, uh on that team. You were able to find some information about this team. Well, I looked at the roster, and of course, as a Grizzlies fan, Nick Kalaitis' name is going to jump out at me because he spent, I think I want to say two, three seasons uh, with the Grizzlies as a backup to Mike Conley uh, about five, six years ago. So, like, you've been able, just kind of going off of what I've been able to read, and obviously with a former NBA point guard there, it's obviously better talent. But what I'm talking about that it goes just as well as Tuesdays is the broadcast because we got, we're told that the quality was actually really good. I'm guessing the gym that they're going to be playing in today in Barcelona is will be a step up from a high school gym. Uh, and you that's, know, what, that's what it looked like in, in Valencia. Yeah, that's that, exactly that looked what it looked like, like, a, like in Valencia. It looked like a lower play. level high school gym, of which there are probably a dozen, if not more, nicer basketball mm-hmm. arenas for high schools in Arkansas. I'm guessing they'll be playing at an arena about the same size as like a, as a Hot Springs, a, a, a Fayetteville. A, you know, north side, south side here here in Fort Smith that you know, might get a little bit better of a quality. Just hopefully the technical issues don't uh, happen like we're all expecting them to with Flow Sports. And real quick, I do want to – I hate to correct you so early into the show, but Barcelona is on the coast. They are? I, said, just, I didn't know my I know, Spanish I know, geography. I know. Like I'm, I just letting, I'm just letting you know. Just up the coast from Valencia uh, on the Mediterranean side of Spain. I had to look it up. I didn't know for 100% for sure. So maybe they will frolic in the beach maybe. In, the, in the ocean a little bit. Uh, by the way, for, you, for those who want, like, want to hate on, on the Flow Sports deal, um, I understand. Like they, Flow Sports sent two camera people, cameramen, to, uh, to Spain and Italy for this mm-hmm. trip. I mean, they're the only ones who... They didn't just decide. hire some locals? No, they, they hired. They sent people there. Uh, they sent them across the pond with the basketball team. So they put money where their mouth was, mm-hmm. effort into it as well. But it still sounds like it's a little bit of a frustrating product sometimes, even though you've got a home announcer calling it, and that usually means they know the team that they're calling. So, uh, again, it's a 1.30 tip-off. It's just before we get off the air today, uh, so we won't be giving you many updates on that, but I assume we'll have a lot of people that are listening and hear Jamie May text in some... some, uh, some research on, on Barcelona says that they are 27-7, and seven, but lost to Valencia and lost to them twice. And that was a different Valencia team than the Hogs played on Tuesday. You got to remember that. Barcelona probably lost to the number one Valencia team. The Hogs played like the fourth level team. Right. And that's the other thing, too. Like, I looked up Barcelona basketball 
they have it's owned by Barcelona FC. Mm-hmm. Like the way this the way this operates in so the many soccer of the, team. Yeah, it's 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 operated by Barcelona FC. Uh, so I, I don't know if, if they're playing like the first team, which is what the Barcelona basketball team is called. The real like major mm-hmm. league professional basketball team that they've got for European basketball is called Barcelona First Team. I don't know if this is them, the Toto Estrellas, mm. the All Stars. I guess. Anyway, it, 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 oh, Arkansas it's supposed to be better. That's what I've heard. Yeah, and it should be a lot of fun to watch them because it just seems like it's a ton of fun to watch this team above the rim. Uh, playing with speed and, again, on a 24-second shot clock. So they seem to be built for that kind of basketball. Bob Holt coming up next segment. Clay Henry joins us for a couple of hours beginning at 12 at uh, 1130. And Grant Hall joins us, our number three, to get into Arkansas football, Arkansas basketball. And we got some baseball stuff that happened yesterday as well. We'll be right our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports development. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, to get the bonus and get into the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Back to the guys. Here's Phil Elson, Matty T, and Drew Barrett. Kind of had to chuckle when I saw them t- tee you up. Did you say something in Spanish or English, or what was the deal with that? Started off in English, ended up in Spanish. It's Bob Holt asking uh, Eric Musselman, uh, I guess a fairly obvious question when it comes to getting a technical and you're playing a game in Spain. Uh, and I guess Mus is uh, multilingual. We've got Bob Holt with us right now from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Bob, appreciate you, man. Um, <laughs> when you when you saw Mus get the technical in the first quarter, you're thinking, "Wow, he's he, he's in he's in midseason form." You didn't think he'd be asking about a T here in 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 August, did you? Well, it wasn't a total shock. I know we asked him. You know, we we talked to Eric. I think it was three different times. Uh, from June and then in July and then in August before they went over and I asked them uh, I can't remember exactly how I phrased the question but I kind of asked them about you know uh, the officials over there you assume I mean talk about home cooking you think you'd really get home cooking when you're going across the ocean as the other team would and uh, he said you know from his international experience which he's had a lot of international coaching experience that they, they are pretty quick to tee up and I think Arkansas was up by about 30 at the time, but the free throw differential was pretty blatant. And so I think Eric was uh, probably, you know, complaining about that. And I, you know, but obviously it didn't have any impact on the game. Just kind of a fun thing, honestly. So impressions of uh, of what you saw? It's the first game. It's one game. Everybody played. We know quite often it's not going to be that kind of a situation with this team. But impressions of the first game that you watched? Well, yeah, obviously. I mean, they, that other team, I'm not really familiar with their roster, the, the Valencia. I think it's like Valencia and, and translated into English. But, um, yeah, it was impressive. I mean, just their athleticism, they just totally overwhelmed them. You know, I mean, I, I counted 17 dunks for Arkansas and a lot in the open court. And just, you know, Nick Smith looked really good, scoring in a variety of ways, uh, you know, hitting some – Three pointers. Obviously, they they need to improve three point shooting. That that was an issue last year, and it looks like they're going to have better three point shooting with some of the guys they have. And um, yeah, very, very impressive. Uh, but also, Eric talked about how there's some things they have to work on. They gamble too much on defense. Need to show more discipline. But yeah, it just showed I think how what what a what a good you know deep roster they have, and it's really going to be. Interesting to see how they divide up playing time. Obviously, you know guys like Nick Smith and Jordan Walsh and Anthony Black and some others are going to play a lot of minutes. But you know, Eric's known for having a pretty tight rotation, seven, eight guys. Certainly, by the time they get to SEC play, and it'll be interesting to see if maybe he goes a little deeper because there's there's a lot of talent on this team. Yeah, and there's a lot of newcomers too. When you count the transfers and the freshmen, there's eleven of them, eleven of them. And I mean, look, this is the way that that college sports teams are built now but nobody does it any better as far as the, the transfer portal and now maybe through high school recruiting than than eric musselman um and 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 there's a sense like this is the kind of trip 
that a team with 11 newcomers would really want to have in order in order to get a sense of 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 how they get along of uh off the court on the court you know and and coaches will tell you and it's true nothing brings a team together more than traveling together and winning when you're traveling together and the opportunity to do that when there's really just a few handfuls of college basketball teams that are taking international trips like this in August, and I know you have to wait another, I think it's four or five years to do one of these again. Like, this is the right team to have a trip like this right now, right? Yeah, and they've talked about, the, you know, the chemistry's been pretty good. Most of these guys have been on campus since late May, early June. Anthony Black got in a little late because he was playing with the under, I think it was the under-20 team or under-19 team, the USA team in Mexico, where they just blitzed. <laughs> six opponents, one by five, an average of 40 points. But, um, yeah, I mean, when you uh, fly together, I think I said it was a nine-hour flight over there. Um, and if they probably slept a good bit of that, I would think maybe not. I, I certainly would have, I think. But, yeah, and you, you can see they're doing a lot of fun activities together. They're posting videos on social media where they're spending a lot of time on the beach, you know, playing uh, football and volleyball without a net, just having a good time. And, I think it's great that Eric um, is letting them have a lot of fun. Obviously, the most fun is when you go and play good basketball, but but he's letting them do things. And um, sounds like the guys are pretty smart about having a good time, but also when it's time to get off their feet, they're getting arrested, fresh for the game. That's also where it helps you play 13 guys. I mean, you don't play anybody 30 minutes or whatever. And um, But, yeah, I think a trip like this, uh, for any team would be a good bonding experience, so especially when you have that many new players. It, it, you're right, the time is really good, although you wonder if this is going to become a norm where you're having, I don't know, about 11 newcomers every year, but I think most good college Hey, Bob, we're having a little trouble with the connection here uh, with you. I don't know if we got some phone issues uh, is that, or something. Sorry, is that better? Yeah, it sounds a like bit it's, better. Sounds like it's a uh, um, a little bit better. So thanks for for checking into that. Okay. Uh, Twenty four okay. second shot clock. It's a team also that's built for speed, um, and not every Eric Musselman team is is going to be you know trying to get it down the court lickety split. But certainly when you create a turnover, you're going to look to do that. I love the idea that they're playing international rules because of the twenty four second clock. And I think they are excited about that as well. You know, these other teams are used to playing with that. So they're getting down the court awfully quickly. Maybe initially that takes them a little bit by surprise. But offensively, man, I love the idea that this team can get down the floor quickly and create quickly. Yeah, I don't think they had any shot clock violations the other day. I might be wrong about that, but I don't remember one. And they were, like you said, there there was a lot of points off turnovers where they were Played in the open court, fast break opportunities, and and then when they did uh, come down, and set up, they got off, you know, pretty good shots uh, most of the time. And maybe it was a couple times the shot clock was running down. They, I think maybe there was one Debo had to jack one up from pretty deep, but uh, Debo Davis. But yeah, for the most part, they got really good looks. I think they shot close to sixty percent from the field, from uh, you know, unofficial stats and. Uh, yeah, and of course the NBA plays with a 24-second shot clock, and all these guys want to play in the NBA, and I think a lot of them are going to play in the NBA. So um, they'll get back to the 30-second shot clock when the season starts, when the regular season starts. But yeah, I'm sure they probably like playing with a 24-second shot clock because that, that's the, uh, you know, uh, an advertisement of things to come for them. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Bob, we know that with a lot of these trips and the teams, uh, a lot of the college teams play – uh, either overseas, down in the Caribbean, just wherever they decide to do their international uh, little basketball tour, that the reason why these games are played at night for the most time is so that guys can go to their 9-5 and five and then put on the basketball shoes and go to the gym. But with this Barcelona team, this is actually a professional team and probably, the from what I've been told, the closest to talent that they're going to see uh, throughout the regular season Um is that the case, and it's going to get back to easier, or is the level of competition going to go up when it gets into Italy, as far as you know? I'll be honest. I'm not really that sure about the rosters. I also know these things can be in flux. I mean, I was looking at the uh, uh, Valencia team. You know, look them up. You can Google Valencia, Celestio, and however you say that word. Mm-hmm. And it talked about how their next game was in – October, so this is their off season, and you know, might just be, hey, what guys can you get? 
Um, I know that the other team, Valencia, had a couple American players on their roster, but those guys didn't play in the game. So um, I'll be honest, I'm not really sure about the, the opponents. I, I think it's older guys, and that's probably good for them to play some of those teams. Obviously, that team the other day was no match for them, and I'm sure Eric would like to get some better competition. But I'll be honest, I'm not really sure about the rosters, and I think they they could be in flux, you know, um, with – who can play? Who's available? You know how much they're paying them. That that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Now you t- you talked about it earlier about how it's going to be hard to see where Musselman is going to cut this rotation down because normally, you know, throughout as the season progresses, we we know that Musselman likes to get it down to you know a seven man rotation. But with how much talent they have right now, could you see that? And I know we're only one game in, so this is a lot to ask, you know, for you to predict. Could you see a possible 10, 11 man rotation, not just to start the season, but through March? Man, it's hard for me to picture Eric playing 10 or 11 guys, um, you know, in a, in a big rotation, and at, you know, as they're going in the NCAA tournament or SEC play. That just to me hadn't been his, his, um, his MO. But one thing is, they've, you know, they they have a good depth now if guys get injured. Obviously, hope everybody stays healthy. But if they have some issues, um, you know, I think they've got some, some guys who can step up and fill in for minutes. But I can see maybe expanding the bench a little bit. But playing 10, 11 guys, that, that, that's just hard mm-hmm. to picture. Um, you know, I think he wants to give his best players, you know, well over 30 minutes. And then you're going to see maybe three guys off the bench, maybe four. But it also gives them flexibility depending on who they're playing. Are they playing a big team? Are they playing a smaller, quicker team? So he's got some good flexibility if they want to play small ball, quote, although small ball would be a relative term with this team because they're so big everywhere. But, um, yeah, I don't see Eric playing 10 or 11 guys. That, that's just hard for me to picture, although obviously that will be up to him. Hey, Bob, before we let you go, I want to ask about your um, your piece about Isaiah Satania in the Democrat Gazette today. Uh, who was it in the article here that says football and track are kind of like brothers? Like, these are the two sports. If you're going to do two sports, this is the, this is the way to do it. Uh, football and baseball um, is really difficult to pull off. Football and basketball is really difficult to pull off. We've seen that in the case of Connor Noland, Matt Jones, a few others. But football and track certainly work in, in tandem if you're going to be on the outside, you know, the outdoor track team and play football at the same time. Uh, and the coaches seem to be totally uh, agreeable to, uh, to Isaiah doing this. So uh, he, he's got the opportunity to, to not just, you know, play football and play track at, and run track at Arkansas, but be a star maybe in both cases. Yeah, there's, there's Chris Buckman, the men's track coach at Arkansas, that said that those, those teams, those sports are like brothers, and I thought it was a great point. Um, you, you know, if you're obviously having a good football season, you, you want to be playing into January in a bowl situation. <coughs> Excuse me, and then that's about the time the track season starts. And um, it's like Chris said, the better Isaiah does in football, the more he'll get to do in track because, you know, if he plays a lot of football, they'll say, okay, well, he's got this thing down pretty good. Let's let him focus on track. If he maybe has some issues, which a lot of freshmen would, they might say, well, you know, he can go work, you know, do track workouts and go to meets, but he needs to do more football stuff in the spring. So we'll see how that shakes out. But certainly Isaiah was not going to go to a school that wasn't going to offer, uh, you know, both sports. And, you know, he committed to A&M originally. They have really good track committed to Oregon then they have really good track then ultimately came to Arkansas that we know they have really good track and of course his dad was a track guy at the NCAA champion in the decathlon at LSU and his mom was a sprinter for the Jamaican Olympic team so he has obviously has good track genes but um yeah I, I think they're you know they're going to do a good job of sharing him and doing what's best for Isaiah and, you know, ultimately, hopefully he'll, he'll have, you know, a decision to make on those calls, too. Like, well, I want to focus on this, you know, right now, you know. Well, I also saw in the article he wants to play in the NFL and be in the Olympics, so he might not be making that choice for a while. <laughs> Bob, appreciate you, man. Thanks for your time, as always. Okay. You, you guys take care. All right, Bob. Appreciate Holt, it, Bob. Democrat Gazette. Always appreciate his time Thursdays. And speaking of our time, we are going to be, Drew and I are in Branson tomorrow at the home of the Babe Ruth League's Cal Ripken Majors 70 World Series. Teams from Mexico, Japan, Canada, Korea, 
and the United States are currently playing in bracket play. Just got past pool play a couple of days ago. And uh, USA and international championships are tomorrow. And then the whole thing is decided Saturday in Branson, the home of the Babe Ruth League's Cal Ripken Majors 70 World Series. So come out and meet me and Drew at the tournament tomorrow. Uh, We'll be there from 11 until 2 for a live edition of Halftime. And you can go to BabeRuthWorldSeries.org for more information. Clay Henry joining us next. Attention tequila lovers. Get by Eastside Liquor in Fort Smith and check out their full selection of Cava de Oro tequilas, including Blanco, Reposado, Añejo, Extra Añejo, Cristalino Añejo, Plata Tajona, and Extra Aged Añejo in the Black Bottle. Available at Eastside Liquor at 9390 Rogers Avenue in Fort Smith. Now, back to the podcast. We got Clay Henry joining us for the next couple of hours here on a Thursday on Halftime. Clay, how you doing, man? I'm good. I, I've, I've got to figure this out, though, This this uh, my radio hours, because I did morning with uh, Tommy and Ty. I know. And then I put everything up. <laughs> and, and I've got this neat little... I've got this neat little slide-out drawer in my cabinets that all my radio stuff is in, and then I set it up on the kitchen table, dining room table, I should call it, and I put it all up this morning. Well, you know, an hour later, I'm getting it all back out. That's right. You got to make yourself a little home studio. Mm-hmm. You know, like I've got here, uh, I got a, I got a desk. I got the stuff out. I never put it away unless we're going. I'm going to pack it up because we're, we're going to head into Branson yeah. later on today. But uh, yeah, you need a, you need a home studio, man. I mean. You know, I would picture a Clay Henry home studio as uh, looking more like uh, a trophy room for uh, for fish that you've caught than anything else. But you can okay, fit the equipment right and a microphone me, in there. Right above me, this is in our dining room. So all this stuff was in the man cave when we lived in Fayetteville, suburbia. And then we, uh, you know, we moved here and... All the stuff from the man cave is now in the living room, dining room. There's there's six ducks on the wall. There's a there's a replica of a 24 inch Bonneville cutthroat. There are two bamboo antique bamboo fly rods that are over 80 years old with antique reels there on the wall. There are pictures of trout on the wall. There's pictures. Uh, there's a picture of an Indian chief a Su- in a Sioux war bonnet that our daughter painted at Governor School. That is massive. I could send you these pictures and y'all would get it. But so all this stuff that was in the man cave is now made. You know, it's a river house, is mm-hmm. what my wife explained, and it qualifies to be out on display. It did not qualified to be out in a house in suburban Fayetteville. I understand that. So ah, does that okay. mean you have no man cave or is that just the whole house is like the a, house man cave is a man house? Cave. Wow. The house is a man cave. See that that's called success. That when is. you when you have when you have retired but still getting <laughs> still getting uh, writing and broadcasting jobs after announcing your retirement and your entire house is a man cave house. Clay, I really want to live up to the standards that you're setting here for me. Well, uh, there's a lot of people that are starting to send me messages that they would like to trade places. They like, I trade my life for yours. Uh, and I don't want to trade. I'm happy. And now I do have, we have a, uh, a den that has, it's, uh, it's like a Florida sunroom that was added on, that we added on to this house. It was a, uh, an upstairs deck. You know, screened-in porch, but we've closed it in with lots of windows, and that's where my fly tying desk is. So I'm on the second story of a split-level house, and it looks out in the backyard where the deer play. Well, that's am sounds... I painting the picture? This is Chuck yeah. Barrett type stuff. You, you, are, great. you are definitely painting a picture with brush strokes and everything. I don't know if it's uh, it's more like Bob. Ross. I'm I'm picturing Bob Ross is what I'm seeing here. Uh, Clay, we we talked quite a bit yesterday about. The uh, Arkansas wide receivers, mm-hmm. which I don't think are very much of a of a question mark. It's just because nobody's really produced at Arkansas yet amongst the group of receivers. But you look at Jaden Hazelwood, you look at Matt Landers; these guys produced at other schools. And I think a healthy Keytron Jackson Jr. is probably a really good Keytron Jackson Jr. So I don't look at what at the wide receivers necessarily as a question mark. Do you? No, and I would throw in. 
uh, Malik Hornsby in that yeah, group in that too. too. And he's he's gonna factor in at wide receiver, and there's gonna be plays where he and he and uh, KJ Jefferson kind of slide around. Like I think KJ will probably get some wide receiver looks. Uh, really? Well, I mean, they're gonna be on the field at the same time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, it may be that he lines up at running back. It may be that he lines up in the slot. I I imagine him being used too, like KJ, like uh, Traylon Burks. You know, like. You put him. You put him in the slot. I mean, this is my kind of play call, and I mean, I don't know if it's Kendall Bryles, but you've got you've got Hornsby going one way in an RPO, and all at once you've got KJ coming back. Uh, you know, in some kind of reverse. Now I haven't seen any practices. I'm going to go next week for a couple of practices. You flip it to him, and then he passes it to Jaden Hazelwood, or he throws it back to to Hornsby. How about those kind of plays? Ooh, mm-hmm. I yeah. mean, it sounds exactly like what Kendall Browse would want to do. We've seen him draw up oh, some kooky happen. stuff, so it definitely could see some of those reverse pitchbacks, double reverses, and and everything else uh, in yeah, between. KJ's- KJ and, and, and Malik, Malik just throwing it around to each other. Well, just think about last year. The wide receiver pass was was part of the offense, mm-hmm. but the wide receiver pass came from Traylon Burks. Or if I remember, I think Warren Thompson. Hope I don't see that again. In this case, you got a quarterback playing as wide receiver i keep reading that malik has improved his accuracy at practice i obviously haven't seen it but i think we will see it in that case mm-hmm. right yeah and he can throw the deep ball the the thing about burks and i i know there's you know there's angst about some of the play calls that you know the, the trick plays but there were plays where you know he looked to pass and he just didn't like what he saw and he ran it for 10 mm-hmm. and we we forget about those plays and I, I think that Hornsby will do the same things, all right? This was, you know, we're going to throw it over to him here, and he's going to look down the field. But, hey, the number one option might be to get everybody backpedaling him, just run it. Uh, because he is deadly, as you saw, you know, in the tail end of the Penn State game. You just, you know, you just, just got to get him the ball and put him in open field situations and mm-hmm. i mean that's what they're going to do and clay yesterday me and phil we were talking about this wide receiver group and you know it's it's preseason. we're getting glowing reports out of camp like you always do uh during this this time leading up to the season and you get the reports that this team's gonna be the greatest thing to ever touch a touch a football field and you kind of buy into that a little bit so With as many guys as you could see making real impacts in this wide receiver group, let's say Jason Hazelwood, Jaden Hazelwood is the leading receiver. How many actual catches does that translate to? I mean, I don't don't think it does 50. Does it 40, 35? I I have no idea. I mean, first of all, you know, it's it's the defense determines all that, guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's if if people want to, you know, want to sit back and play pass, well, they won't throw it. They'll run it down your throat because they're they're going to have that kind of an offensive line and that kind of a running game with with KJ and Hornsby. I mean, so that gets people up in the box, but it's a cat and mouse game. You're only as good as the quarterback is from the time they you know they line up i'm talking about the defense mm-hmm. line because they're going to be lined up immediately the offense right that's the way they're yeah. they, they don't huddle so you're as good as the quarterback that can look around and look over at browse and say this is how they've got the box so this is what we're going to run and everybody thinks well you're you're calling plays from the sideline well no, you're you're reacting to coverages you're reacting to alignments and you know that that's one of the beauties of this offense is that in that the development you've got veterans you know that in the offensive line you've got KJ that's been around it for three years this is the second year to start but he was around it in the first year watching Franks run the the system mm-hmm. but the, again the beauty is that he doesn't throw interceptions he doesn't put the ball on the ground I mean that's what I'm saying about KJ that's 
I don't care what you want to say about how many yards he runs it for or how many yards he throws it for. If you don't turn it over, you win games in this system. So much of, I think, what the play call is going to be sometimes is dictated by the situation and the score, certainly in the way the defense lines up. But you know how this is. If Arkansas is trailing and it's a couple touchdowns and it's late in the third quarter, you're going to have to air it out a little bit probably. If they have the lead in the second half, like this is a run-first team. Even even if the defense is playing against the run, if they've got the lead in the second half, like Sam Pittman will run it against you. Yeah, but if you back off in the secondary, running it becomes big chunk plays with these backs. So it's, you know, you don't have to throw it to get chunk plays. Mm-hmm. Uh, ask Texas. <laughs> just, just ask. Just ask. You know, the, those Longhorn fans, you know, like, did Arkansas have to throw it to get chunk plays? No, they didn't. They they, they, they can, and but that's what lead. You know, if you're good at everything, then the defense is really in a bind. And I think that's the goal of the Browse offense. Okay, we got Clay with us up until 1.30 in the afternoon here on Halftime. If you got a call or a text, question for Clay or us, 877 877- 377-6963. I had a request for Ty Richardson, who is at the Phoenix Avenue Hardy's location in Fort Smith for another qualifying round of the football trip of a lifetime. You gotta finish your Hardy's Thick Burger in 90 seconds or less, and then you are entered into the August 20th finals. Winner gets tickets to see the Chiefs and the Titans November 6th in Kansas City. The the thing is 90 seconds or less. I dared Ty to do it in 60 seconds or less. He says he can do it. He can do it. Just not today wimp (laughs) go ahead and prove it now yeah speaking of now we're going to take a break now and be right back on get by east side liquor at 9390 rogers avenue in fort smith today and pick up a four pack of the new crown royal cocktails available in whiskey and cola peach brewed tea green apple and now whiskey lemonade try some today now back to the podcast Going halftime here, wrapping up the first hour with Clay Henry, Phil Elson, Maddie T, Drew Barrett. They just sent me a photo of his uh, of the man cave house, the living room portion of the so man cave house. So now I have a house. question. He, he said there's six ducks on the wall. Do they happen to be in a row? Nah, <laughs> they're, they're on different walls. Well, I see three of them. Uh, okay. Yeah, I see three of them on the wall here. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Those Clay, are I- two greenhead mallards and a wood duck. And then on the far wall are a greenhead mallard and two pintails. Mm. How are things going at the bait shop these days? The bait shop. Oops. You Did I uh, say something wrong? Bait shop. <laughs> Drew, what are we going to do with I, I have no idea, Clay. Well, I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know. I've taken him fishing. I've tried to, I mean, to f- be, make him a true outdoorsman. There's a, no bait. You're a fly fisherman. Fly the, sh- it's the, the fly shop. The fly is not bait? No. Fly, the flies are, they could be lures, they, they're they flies. Uh, you you can use uh, lures to trout fish, but I, and, and I have, and I have used bait, but I work at the fly shop. There are no, uh, there are no lures there. I do tie flies. I think I've tied 30, and since I've started working there, I guess two and a half months, I've tied 33 dozen flies. All of a sudden, I start. I now feel like one of the reporters at the TV stations in Little Rock when I worked for the Travelers, and I had to remind them, "Look, the manager is not coach. You not don't call coach. the manager coach." That's what I feel like right now. I called flies bait. Well, Phil's Whoops. used to using his arm and going noodling. <laughs> yeah, and my arm is bait enough. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, there's some of the grocery stores here. In fact, the Harps. You can go in and buy live bait. I'm talking about you know worms. Mm. I don't know if you can get minnows. There's a gas station right across from us here at the station where you can. They have refrigerated uh, worms and stuff. They have refri- night crawlers, yep. right? Now that mm-hmm. that was that was fishing to me growing up in Pittsburgh. That's, my father you, would take there's me. No, there's nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with, with that. that. It's just I just not, don't do not, that. It's not bait. It's not flies. It's bait in that case. Yeah. It's, Fly it's too simple. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the with the with the rod and reel and a bobber and a worm on a no hook. question, but. The more advanced that you do get with it, when you go from that type of fishing to, you know, using a bait caster, then to using a fly rod, 
the harder it is, the more rewarding it is, is what I've always found. It's, it's, I never really wanted to get into fly fishing. My dad got into it about 10 years ago, had taught me like enough just to get it out there about eight years ago. First time I hooked a fish, I was done. I was hooked. I, I mean, I was literally hooked onto fly fishing to where now that's all I want to do when I go fishing. Well, I, I think it's more in, in it's sporting. Mm-hmm. It's it is you're fooling them with something that you make. Now I like. There's a lot of people that fly fish that don't make their own flies. That's uh, that's next level stuff, and it's very time consuming. But it's not hard to learn. I mean, you, you can go. You don't even have to take lessons anymore. I was at the fly shop, oh, three weeks ago, and a 15 year old young man came in. His parents were waiting in the car for him, and he came in and wanted some fly tying material, and he said. I, uh, I I haven't had any lessons. I I ordered a fly tying kit online, and I've studied um, um, YouTube. Mm-hmm. And it, it's I mean you can you can repair a washing machine through YouTube. You can learn how to tie flies through YouTube, and it's really incredible that you know how close they get and show you the detail. So it's not like this is anybody can do it. Um, but it's, I'll just tell you what it is. It is arts and crafts for old men. <laughs> well, my, my grandfather used to do, um, uh, stained glass. I think what you're doing is a little bit more active. JW is on hold here. JW, how are you doing, man? Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, we're talking about a subject uh, near and dear to my heart. And I love fly tying. And I know that the river rat that's on knows what I'm talking about. There are people who tie flies that catch fly fishermen, and then there are people who catch flies that catch fish. And I was blessed to have been taught the gospel according to Fox, a man named Fox Stadley, Mr. Salbug, how to tie the salbug fly and then learn how to dead drift it through his tutelage. And then after I learned everything he taught me, I, of course, broke all the rules and created my own reality. <laughs> but, and I've come up with flies myself, but I am not a person who can tie pretty flies. They might not be resellable, but they catch fish. And it's a whole different reality. And I'm envious. I wish I had a river house. Well, there's, there is nothing like filling up the bins like I did yesterday at the fly shop and then coming back next week and they've all sold. Mm. You know, I'm talking about dozens and dozens and dozens. And that's that's the margin of a fly shop. It's the cheapest thing to produce that brings in the most revenue. Clay, and I that's why it. they call it a fly shop. I heard a, um, I heard a, uh, a, a term there from GW that must be a term of uh, endearment. I mean, if, if you say a guy who won't leave the basketball gym is a gym rat, I won't leave the ballpark as a ballpark rat. Those are terms of endearment. Clay, we're allowed to call you, you old river rat. Is that okay? That is fine. All right. Well, we'll see if we can stick with that throughout the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, Clay Henry, Clay River Rat Henry, joining us until 1.30 here on Halftime. Stay with us. We're going to get into the second hour right after this. Eastside Liquor has more than just liquor. They also have wellness products and now carry Marley CBD gummies. They come in amazing flavors like Island Punch and Coconut Vanilla. They come in 200 milligram tin packs, so stop by 9390 Rogers Avenue and pick some up today. Now, back to the podcast. Moving along on a lovely Thursday across the natural state, halftime into the second hour. Out of three, remember, we have moved this... I was about to call it award-winning. I don't think it's award-winning, not yet, but it will be because of a third hour that has been added into halftime for the foreseeable future. 877-377-6963. We are joined by Clay Henry for the next 90 minutes, and we always appreciate his time. And he just did a little education on me. Uh, no we'll longer, get back to football now, right? Yeah, we'll get, to, we'll get to football here. But I now know that a fly shop is where he's working instead of the bait shop. We do have some football questions that have come in from some of our listeners. And uh, remember, you can text in, the, you can call or text with a question, 877-377-6963. 
Uh, we, we talked earlier, Clay, that maybe wide receivers shouldn't really be looked at as a question mark. You just might not have quite as dominant of a receiver as you did in Traylon Burks. There is a question mark, though, on the other side of the ball if Arkansas can generate a pass rush because it really didn't have too much of a pass rush last year. Team totaled 25 sacks, 43 hurries. 25 sacks was 13th in the SEC. Only Vanderbilt had fewer, and they had six. And you've lost your two leading sackers. Trey Williams had six. Hayden Henry had four. Zach Williams is the leading returning uh, sack artist, if you want to call him that, at three and a half. So, uh, you know, you've brought in Jordan Dominic, defensive end from Georgia Tech, Landon Jackson transferring in from LSU, Dorian Gerald, Deshaun Stewart, Eric Gregory. Gregory's shown some things at times. Wh- where, where will this pass rush come from? Or, or do you, th- it won't necessarily just be from your three down lineman or if you go to a, to a four down lineman alignment. Is this going to be a team that blitzes more often than we saw last year? Well, it's not about the guys that you mentioned uh all of those can could be effective given the right schemes and the right uh you push the right buttons but it comes down to can you cover and can you cover on the outside can your nickel and your corners cover in other words can they give you the time for a blitz to be executed and for a guy you know you you can you can bring more than they can block in in there's a lot of teams that did you know that that will do that at times but only if you've got corners and nickels that can cover you know three counts four counts to give you the time to get there because you can send extra guys and if a slant is open then they'll throw slants and those guys will just run forever because there's nobody there. You've brought them. Um, so it comes down to how well you cover on the outside, how much pressure you can be, bring. And, you know, Barry Odom has calculated, you know, from what he's seen in practice against Arkansas's receivers, you know, what he's got at cornerback. There is some belief uh, within the team and those that watched bring, you know, the, the scrimmages that they can cover a little better and you know we'll see and it's it is you're not going to leave those guys on an island if they can't cover and that's what happens if you blitz now you know the idea that you know maybe you could play a four down lineman and somebody can beat one on one that's the ultimate way to get pressure i mean that's that's the if you got four guys and you know they can't double team all of them. You got five offensive linemen. If one of those guys can beat pressure, and that's that's what the great defensive linemen do. And you know Trey Flowers, he could beat his man one on one and get a sack. Mm-hmm. And now, do they have somebody like that? Is, is you know the Georgia Tech transfer? He's got sacks against ACC teams. Uh, Dorian Gerald has shown that at times, if he can be healthy. Um, so Landon Jackson, I mean, he was a sack machine when he's been healthy. So there's some hope that they can beat one-on-one, uh, beat an offensive tackle. You know, I think Isaiah Nichols and Eric Gregory inside, if they're not double team, can get pressure. The guy that that I just have great hope for that can be a blitzer is Drew Sanders. Mm-hmm. He he was an edge rusher at Alabama and started. And when he got hurt, they plugged in another guy and he never never played other than special teams after that. But what I saw his swim move is fantastic. He can get get pressure on the edge. Now he's going to play inside linebacker. Right. But that doesn't mean that you can't walk him up you know, you're in a three-man front, and you decide to make it a four-man front, and you walk him up on the outside, or put him inside of a, you know, a defensive end in a three-point stance, or you know, leaning in there in a two-point stance. He's got that swim move that can be an effective blitzer. But to do that, you got to cover. You got to cover with the nickel. You've got to protect the middle. Um, you know, so, but but who are going to be the playmakers? 
outside of Bumper Pool and Jalen Catalan, I think Miles Slusher is mm-hmm. will be terrific. I think he's a difference maker. You know, we saw a little bit of him last year, uh, but I think he is uh, he's a guy that can play the ball in the air. Um, I think I think Brenny can play in there. I think Chavis on the outside. I think he's got ball skills. So has McLaughlin, transfer from LSU. Um, but it's uh, you know it, it, this is a defense that I'm excited to see what they've got. I think they're more talented, and they've got more parts. They're deeper. They've got more guys in the secondary to absorb injuries, and I you know and I think they've added you know the help they probably need uh, up front. Now that's the you know the big deal is nose guard. You know who's gonna because John Ridgeway was just terrific last yeah. year, and he he didn't make you know a huge number of plays, but he showed enough in that Texas game that everybody decided we got to double him. Well, that just frees up your linebackers when you've got two guys inside blocking on your nose guard. It just changes the the, the whole concept of defense and and makes it easy for your two inside linebackers to play their gaps, and they're not going to get blocked. I mean, if the, if the guard's having to help the center on a nose tackle, can can Isaiah Nichols do that? You know, do they slide Eric Gregory over there? Can he do that? Uh, you know, Terry Hampton, the transfer from Arkansas State, does he have that kind of ability that, that just make you double team? I don't know. In in. Nichols is the guy that I that I think in, in Gregory that I that I have great hope for. I know the coaches have talked a little bit about Cam Ball as well. Dominic, yeah, he's he's got that too if he can stay healthy. Yeah, six five three thirteen redshirt freshman out of Atlanta. Um, you know, and talking about depth, Dominique Bowman spoke on the top four cornerbacks. I want to play this quote, but then you know you talked about the idea of depth at this position. Uh, right now it's Day Day, it's Hud, it's Malik, it's Nudie, Dwight, four guys in the mix, uh, Kiwan, Kyrie, all those guys been competing, but the ones and twos right now have been those four guys. I'm talking about Hudson Clark, he's, I mean, he's a good player. I mean, he's, he's athletic, he's long, and he's smart, cerebral. So he's, he's talking about uh, Ladarius Bishop, Hudson Clark, Dwight McLaughlin, who's Nudie, my new favorite nickname, and Malik Chavis as the starters, and then Kiwan Parker and Kyrie Johnson fighting for playing time there but so, you, you use the idea of of depth do you think that they haven't had that kind of they haven't had that kind of depth at cornerback in eons and i mean you can you know we've debated on the difference between a fly shop and a bait shop but i, I haven't used eon a long time and i but i think that's accurate they've not ever been in a situation where a, a secondary coach can rip off six names and say we can play them all and I think that's uh, a quiet strength that nobody understands. I'm talking about fans that Arkansas has grown, and Barry Odom has done that in in his his recruiting. I mean, just keeps going out and finding corners and safeties. And you know, it's um, you cannot be where a guy goes down and you know you can't play. I mean, that's what happened at Missouri, right? They ran out of corners and linebackers in that game that got, you know, where they blew the lead. So, uh, but I, I really am fascinated by that buildup at that one position cornerback. And it, mm. you know, and it allows you to, you know, and they've got some guy. I think Miles Sluster is going to be a great nickel. And I, you know, everybody just assumed he'd played the safety his time at Arkansas, but he's got that kind of athletic ability. They lost Greg Brooks. I think most people suspected that would be a heavy loss, losing a start nickel back. But I think I think Slusher might be better than Brooks. I think so too. I think so too. So the idea of depth, and that's the thing that is the toughest, you know, thing to build in a college no football question. program from where. It was when Sam Pittman started as the head coach at Arkansas to where it is now. It's amazing to see them be able to build up depth at, at offensive line, running back, looks like wide receiver as well. Maybe not so much tight end right now, but that's, on, that's coming. That's coming down the pipeline. On the other side of the ball, it feels like there's going to be a, a pretty large rotation on the defensive line, both the tackle and at end. You've talked already here about the depth at cornerback and at safety. It's safe to say... The one position where you really don't have that kind of depth is linebacker. Well, 
what I saw in the spring, one of the practices that I went to, and I watched with Harold Horton, and we we watched the linebackers and in individual drills work, work work out in front of us, and the freshmen, Henley, Crook, and then I would throw in Sanders because he was new. That was really entertaining to watch their footwork and bag drills and everything. I, I think that they're – and then we didn't see uh, Manny Powell because he's, you know, rehabbing from knee surgery. But the, those young linebackers – and then, you know, you got, you know, uh, Pooh Richardson, right? And, and he, you know, played a little bit last year, and, you know, with special teams, maybe a game or two. But he, he's highly regarded and has lost some weight. But I think they may have more depth at linebacker than you think, Phil. And, and, you know, Sanders, he had to learn linebacker, but it looked like he learned it really quick. By the time they had that spring game in Walker Pavilion, I don't know if it was a game or not, but their, their last practice. And he's running all over the field, sideline to sideline. And, and it was a breath of fresh air to see him uh, out in the open and chasing down Hornsby. I haven't seen a linebacker at Arkansas move like that in a long time. I've seen guys make a lot of tackles. Bumper and Hayden and, and uh, Morgan, they made tackles, but they didn't cover ground in the open field like that guy does. He's faster, and he is freaky, 6'5", 225. Um, so I, I have hope that this defense is going to be better and be able to cover more in blitz more effective they've called blitzes before but they just didn't get there mm-hmm. Cleveland when you talk about the this defensive back group especially with you know the idea that they're going to be running nickel packages that could be possibly running you know some three two sixes with with the linebackers how big of a role would they play in a pass uh pass coverage uh, schemes I mean because when you have six people behind them it feels like most of the ground is pretty much covered up uh would they just basically be an extension of the defensive line just standing up when it comes to pass coverages no or? they've got to drop they, they've got to drop and they've got to cover and you're playing umbrella with with those guys and the whole idea with offenses now is to run people out of zones mm-hmm. and then attack where you've just taken people away and so the, those linebackers they have to be effective in their in their drops and you know, I think Grant was really good at that. Uh, I think Bumper has been good at that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure Hayden Henry, that was his strength. I think he was more, hey, I, I'm ready to chase somebody down after they catch it. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that that uh, you'll, you'll see those guys drop into coverage, you know, or blitz. And uh, But it's all about disguise and looks and playing – man in zone and combinations and you think they're in zone they're really in man you think you think those guys up front are playing zone and they're really chasing you know they're they're chasing somebody man too you know they're they're covering the backs the linebackers are so if if, you know if you you know you saw against mississippi state that those guys chase those backs when they put them in you know mississippi state all they did was run people in verticals and then toss it to the backs in the flats. So the, the linebackers have to cover that, too. Yeah, it didn't feel much like an air raid. Felt like a, felt like a dink no, and dunk was, raid is what it yeah. was. Yeah. Underneath. Questions for Clay, questions for us. Since Clay is our uh, a resident football expert and our resident river rat, 877-377-6963. Fisherman Clay. Fisherman Clay. I'll go with that one because it sounds a little bit nicer. I don't oh, yeah. really want to be a rat. No. A rat has like a negative connotation unless the word ballpark or gym is in front of it. So maybe river doesn't quite have the connotation we're looking for. Football questions, basketball questions. If you've got a fly fishing question, we might actually ask that too since Fisherman Clay is with us. And more halftime is right after this quick break. Why do people do business with First Western? Because First Western builds relationships with all of their customers. They partner for the long haul to help you with your financial goals over all seasons of life. First Western is prompt, responsive, and they deliver with quick answers and on-time loan closings. When is the last time your banker called you? If you are looking for a high level of service and a financial partner who will listen and respond, try First Western. For more information, visit them online at firstwestern.com. 
Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Just before school starts always seems to be the time that we're going to get haircuts and make sure our teeth are in working order. So you got to get a hold of the folks at Riley Farm Dental, Dr. Bo Sparkman and Dr. Brogan. They'll help you with your teeth, not your hair. They serve to give patients better lives and comfortable experiences, providing all dental procedures, including braces, implants, and cosmetics. Been voted top three best of the best now five consecutive years at Riley Farm Dental. You can give them a call at 226 3500 to schedule an appointment. RileyFarmDental.com, the website. They're located right at the entrance of Riley Farms, Highway 71 at 5901 Riley Park Drive, Suite A, Riley Farm Dental. Uh, Clay Henry joining us on halftime, along with me, Phil Elson, Maddie T, Drew Barrett. Uh, we got a text in here from Mr. Pibb. Uh, Clay wants to know if Arkansas is going to continue running back by committee or you're going to have a primary back. When I hear Sam Pittman talk about, he said this, he says most teams in the SEC don't necessarily have a primary running back. They've spread things out. And when you have such a talented group of running backs. Um, and I think even if Dominique Johnson is unavailable for week one against Cincinnati, which appears that's the case, uh, we've heard glowing reports about Rashad Dubinian, freshman running back. You know A.J. Green um, it has that extra gear. And, and Rocket Sanders probably could be a primary back, but there's too many talented running backs right here. And really, it, 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 it lightens the load a little bit. It's not like Rocket or Dominique or small guys and can't take hits but the fewer the hits you know theoretically the longer the career and i think sam Pittman also spoke to recruiting to that sense you know before you make it to the nfl maybe you'll have fewer hits than than other running backs and that might lead to a, a prolonged career do you think again i think sanders could be a running back that gets 25 carries a game i don't think that's the direction they go with this offense because i think they like running back by committee I think you're right. You know, 15, 18. Now, all things change. You know, if if a guy gets on a roll and, you know, he's scoring touchdowns at will, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, you don't take them off the field. You know, it's, it's like when you had uh, Thurman Thomas. Well, Barry Sanders was the backup, but Thurman Thomas was an All-American, and it was kind of hard to take him off the field even though Barry Sanders was the greatest ever, right? But, you know, it's uh, – and Barry Sanders was a backup in high school to his older brother. And if a guy is just rolling, you just don't take him off. Now, you know, I think eventually you realize, well, that was probably an error in judgment that Barry Sanders should have been playing as much as Thurman Thomas. And and, uh, and I covered those teams. and and But you didn't realize it now. How good is A.J. Green? I mean, is, is he, you know, is he going to emerge as somebody that's better than Rocket Sanders? I don't think so, but he might. How good is Rashad Dubinian? And I think that's the guy that's not getting talked about enough. And I think he is terrific. And when I talked to Kendall Browles in May, he could not stop talking about Dubinian. and said he will be on the field. Now, we know Dominic Johnson was a starter the last six games. He's coming off, you know, knee surgery. You know, or I, I think that's what it was. They're not. They won't say, but um, he'll be back at some point. And he's a beast. So, but but you have the luxury of bringing him along slow because you do have that that kind of depth. You know, it, it running back. And you know, I I think you can. You know, you're going to run KJ and you're going to run, you know, Malik some too, Hornsby. So you you do spread the ball around. Uh, and I, I think the, part of it, too, is they play fast. And they're not running the, sh- the the play clock down like, you know, say Texas did when they had Earl Campbell, when, you know, they're giving it to him 35 times. So if you play fast, you know, they're, the, the running back's going to need a breather after a couple of series if things go the way they want it to. So in, in 2006 and 2007, both Felix Jones and Darren McFadden had 1,000-yard seasons. Back-to-back years, two running backs, over 1,000 yards. Now, admittedly, Casey Dick, Mitch Mustaine were not the most mobile of quarter, but quarterbacks to be running the ball with purpose the way that K.J. is going to run the ball. 
Would that be a reason because KJ is such an effective runner? And I, I, I want to see him run the ball less than he did last year, but you got to be able to utilize that ability too because it's special. Would that be a thing and a reason why you might not end up with – I mean, look, 1,000 yards for two running backs in the same season, the same team is pretty darn impressive. Would you see this team – having the capability of, of having two running backs producing that? Well, let's just be real clear. Darren McFadden and Felix Jones are the best of the best. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you've, just, you've just said a mouthful when you, you start trying to compare these guys to them. And they had Peyton Hillis, too, and they had Michael Smith. And Michael Smith couldn't get on the field, and he was pretty good. But Peyton Hillis was a fantastic blocker in the scheme that they, you know, they ran him at H back, and then every once in a while they'd move him back to running back, right? So they had three NFL guys. Are these NFL guys? Maybe. You know, we need to see a little more of them, Phil and Drew, before we just start ripping off. Like, okay, are they going to get thousand yards? Well, I, I don't know. And you know, what is the SEC right now? What is the schedule right now? Um, and also, can they throw it better? In this RPO game, is is all about attacking what they give you. And if if everybody just lines up in cloud coverage the way Cincinnati did against Alabama, well, yeah, they'll get a thousand yards. They may have three that get a thousand yards, but that's not the way teams are going to mm. try to attack them defensively. They're going to walk safeties up, and then that's why you that's you know that's the fun part when you start throwing over the top against them. Clay, you just brought up Peyton Hillis and, you know, being a great lead blocker. And today's football, both national football, college football, heck, even down to high school and peewee levels, the fullback is a lost position. It's become a lost art in the game. Do you, do you kind of wish that that would uh, make its way back into some type of packages, whether it's for well, Arkansas or just football in general? Just, just go back to what I just said. Mm-hmm. He was an H-back. And the H-back is not a lost position. So you've got the same type guy, you know, he's, he's a tight end, he's a fullback, he's, um, you know, you, you put him in the slot, you can move him into the backfield if you want to, you, you, you motion him across the formation. So that guy is a blocker, and Peyton Hillis would play that in today's game. So it's not a so-called lost position, and I always – you know, I always just kind of chuckle when Brett Bielema would say, hey, we're, we're going to line up with a fullback. Well, then he moved him around and was an H-back. You know, I mean, it's like he put him in motion across the formation and run behind him, or they'd get a linebacker going that way, and they'd go back to the weak side, you know, when you load it up to stop that. So I, I think that when you say, you know, a 230-pound guy like or 240 guy like, like Trey Knox, well, he, he has to be an H-back. He can't just be a tight end. He's got to do – you know other things and Blake Kern what was he well he was almost a fullback at times Mm -hmm. and then then when you run by him and think you just beat a blocker well then he's open in the flats for a pass and that's what Peyton Hillis was too so that fullback better have great hands because when you try to defeat him and then get past him well he just releases you and he's a he's a pass receiver so I, I think that whether it's a traditional, I mean, in the spread, you'd rather not have the fullback and make everybody kind of, you know, you're, you're trying to get people out of the box, not bring people in the box. But then you bring that tight end back into the middle and you, you're, you've got them out manned. 877-377-6963. That was geeky, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it was geeky, but it was good geeky. Football geeky Bug. will work here on this radio station almost any time of the year. Zach and Paragold reminding us about Mike Allstott, one of the best fullbacks ever. Yeah, no question. Running guys over. And he generated his own sound effect from Chris Berman on the highlight shows. I always remember that. <laughs> Daryl Johnson to Moose, yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right, we're going to come back with Clay Henry after this on Halftime. Attention tequila lovers. Get by Eastside Liquor in Fort Smith and check out their full selection of Cava de Oro tequilas, including Blanco, Reposado, Añejo, Extra Añejo, Cristalino Añejo, Plata Tajona, and Extra Aged Añejo in the Black Bottle. Available at Eastside Liquor at 9390 Rogers Avenue in Fort Smith. Now, back to the podcast. 
gosh, I just have to chuckle. Here it was. We thought that Arkansas men's basketball was playing uh, the essentially called the Barcelona All Stars. Mm-hmm. It's not the case. We just got an email from no Arkansas. Nicolaitis? No, they're not playing. Ugh. They're not playing the Toto Estrellas. Unfortunately, this coming from Mike Haywood's email. Uh, that the name of the team Arkansas will play in game two is called Catalan Elite. And apparently um, the broadcast has roster names, no numbers. <laughs> Have fun with that, Zim. That'll be a great time, I'm sure. Uh, 877-377-6963. Clay Henry joining us up until 1.30 on halftime. Pinto is on hold. Hey, Pinto, what's going on? Oh, not much. Wanted to talk to Clay. How are you, Clay? I'm doing great. Thank you, Pinto. Good deal. Glad to have you and Chuck back on the radio regularly. Well, I've back? always been on the radio say, regularly. Did Clay he didn't go? leave. He's been, he's been here the whole time. I know he makes uh, some cameo appearances on, on a weekly basis, but two-hour segment, now you're getting after it. I, 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 well, I, I did two-hour segments, but they were in the morning. You weren't up. That's right. Oh, I was up. <laughs> your partner. Well, we'll stop right there. One of your partners is a uh, reason I didn't tune in too often. <laughs> well, Chuck has gladly taken that spot for me, and he he and I talk. We've been talking for a long time, and he's like, well, I think I'm going to do morning. I said, oh, please do morning. Please. <laughs> please. <laughs> you coach Ty. You work with him. You get him straightened out, and I, I think Ty, Ty is a challenge. Bless Chuck's heart. You know he trained me. He can probably train Ty, but yep. Ty, Ty better be careful. You better be careful. I don't know if Chuck ever described you as a challenge, Clay. Well, oh, we had a lot Chuck, of fun. Chuck, Chuck will line him out in a hurry. I sent uh, Tommy Craft and Chuck a picture. And I'll send it to you boys t- just now that somebody found of me and Chuck, and Pinto was probably there, doing a remote from George's Majestic Lounge for 10.30 a.m. Monday night. You remember those, Pinto? Oh, it started with uh, Rick Schaefer and Joel Casey. Not, not on Monday there. nights at George's. Yeah, I don't see, well, I don't not see Rick George. going over to George's no. Majestic Lounge at any no. moment. But Monday night was the only night you could get a sports talk. No, that's show. true. Yeah, that Back was in the day. Yeah, we. Uh, but yeah, then Chuck and I. He he's like, hey, do you mind doing a remote in a bar? He's like, no. I mean, and we had Biker Dave that made gumbo a few times. Remember Biker Dave? That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Hey, Clay, I wanted to ask you: Have you ever trout fished the Osage? Creek or Osage River up in uh, around the Gravit area, northwest Arkansas. Where have I been on the Osage? Yes, I have. Yep. Yeah, uh, it, it runs out out of Oklahoma into northwest Arkansas. Yep. Yep. I've, uh, I've yeah. fished uh, the Illinois. Uh, fished the Elk. Um, you know, sometimes I wasn't fly fishing though. I might have been spin fishing. You know, right. throwing like little spinner baits and stuff. But yeah, I've, I've hit a lot of those. The Kings, uh, the little mulberry, not the mulberry, but the little mulberry. I've wade fished in tennis shoes and gym shorts, no shirt, with a backpack. And there That's was. That's a visual I don't want to remember. Oh, yeah. Me and Jeremiah Gage from Ozark. And these two boys came down on a ATV, probably 10 and 8. And they're like, this is probably 20 years ago. They're like, how did y'all get in here? And my buddy says, we're with the UN. We parachuted in. (laughs) And the ATV hauled butt, and pretty soon here came a man with a rifle on the ATV. And he looks down. And, of course, Jeremiah grew up in that area, Jeremiah Gage. He's my buddy from Fort Collins, now Loveland. He goes, Jeremiah, is that you? Yeah. Tommy, it's me, me and Clay, and he goes, you're lucky you didn't get shot. We've heard rumors about black tanks and helicopters in here from the U.N., so don't, don't be going on the little mulberry saying you're from the U.N. You won't use that line again. Well, I didn't use it. Well, but 
<laughs> Don't be around it when it's used. Yeah, but we were in tennis shoes and gym shorts. We were obviously not from the UN. That's well, there's, there's a dude over there on, on the uh, Osage that has a rod and gun club. And uh, I got to fish there one time. Taught me a little bit about fly fishing. And he's actually a relative. I think maybe a great nephew of Roger Maris. Really? Oh, he's got a place up there, right? Yeah. Um, I think they call it the Spring Valley Fishing. That, well, I didn't, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to give a, uh, you know, an unsolicited plug, but yes. Spring but that's Valley it. Yeah. Yeah. I have not yeah. fished that little place. I was invited to fish in a tournament there, and it just didn't work out. I think it was a Saturday that a football game was a two-day tournament. But I sent my Adam, Adam, Adam Mears. Adam Maris, yeah, he's a relative of uh, From Broken Air. He's a great nephew of, of uh, Roger, so that's pretty yep. cool. Baseball connection. Spring right, Valley Anglers. Like Pinto, thanks for the phone call and 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 the uh, stuff. Memory the Lane. Maris family, man. Right. Roger Maris was from Minnesota, lived in Texas in his last years, and I had no idea that he had family kin, as we like to say here in Arkansas. Uh, blood relative. There you go. Speaking of kin and blood relative, Eddie in Clarksville is on hold here. Eddie, you got Clay Henry on 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 the show here as well, so we're gonna we got to make this a conversation with Clay, right? Because we got a bunch of people here all at once. What's new? Well, I do my best, sir. Listen here, Mister Clay Henry. Uh, I want to pose a question to you, sir. And I was watching this. He said, "What you comment on it?" You know, uh, they got a new analyst on SEC now. Now uh, he was a linebacker, All American at Auburn. I believe he pronounces his name, his first name, Takeo, last name, Spice. Well, here's what the man said. He said, Arkansas, he had it eight and four as he was going over the schedule yesterday. He had us losing at Starkville. He had us losing in the Plains to the Auburn Tigers. Of course, he had us losing at home, which I got us winning uh, in 16 years. Comes to the end. And Fayetteville, October 1st, against Bama. There he goes again. Oh, Eddie, uh, come on. We had uh, November against the Rebels. And, and I wish he'd come in on that. And number two, I wish he'd come in on this. You know, I was watching it a week or two ago. And Emma said, you know, they had KJ, not the fourth best quarterback in the conference, but the fifth. And then when is this? He had, of course, Bryce, I understand that, Bryce Young. Hard to knock him off the the Heisman winner last year. Then he had Stetson Bennett of Georgia. And then he had, I believe, number three, uh, Hennon Hooker of Tennessee. I believe he had, is it Levis of Kentucky, number four. And Mr. K.J. Jefferson, number five. Well, I got his number two. And I got this. We're going to, if we lose it all, and I got him beating us, it's going to be against Bama. So come in on that, sir. And put I got, that in I got one question. Who's, who do they play first? Who do the Razorbacks play first, Eddie? The silence they speaks play Cincinnati, loudly. you got to start with that game, Eddie. <laughs> you got to start with that game. It's the one that I'm we need to be focused on. You have skipped. You skip it every time. He does. He does. He jumps they right into the Alabama game. They played in the college football playoff last year. That's right. That's They're right. good. They're really good. I just went through their roster, their depth chart, man by man. They've got more experience in the offensive line returning than Arkansas. You got believe that right. it or not. That's exactly right. I did say they are loaded. I want to talk about this stuff in the next segment. What do you say, Clay? I, but Eddie doesn't. Eddie doesn't, but he can he can hang up and listen and then learn okay. a little bit about the first opponent, you know, the one that hey, well, is ranked I, one ahead of Arkansas in the I coaches' poll. For, I look for a wiggle spot to get in there to talk to him, and I never got it. Well, we want before we do that, we got to give a shout-out to our friends at Crabtree RV Center in Alma. They've been serving you for 72 years in the River Valley. Family-owned business on 17 acres right there at the junction of I-40 and I-49 beside the Cracker Barrel. 
huge showroom, 26,000 square foot showroom, indoor floor, RV park service, and parts department as well, all at one convenient location. It's CrabtreeRV.com, or give them a visit across uh, right next to the Cracker Barrel in Alma. You've been voted the best of the best for seven years in a row, so go out and find why that is a fact. We're going to dig into the Cincinnati Bearcats after this on Halftime. Get by Eastside Liquor at 9390 Rogers Avenue in Fort Smith today and pick up a four-pack of the new Crown Royal Cocktails. Available in whiskey and cola, peach brewed tea, green apple, and now whiskey lemonade. Try some today. Now, back to the podcast. All right, getting into wrapping up our second hour of halftime here. Clay Henry joining us along with Maddie T and Drew Barrett. Uh, Clay, we were talking about Cincinnati. I, I dug a little bit into Cincinnati uh, earlier this morning. I'd seen in The Athletic, Bruce Feldman annually does this uh, Freaks of College Football uh, column where he's, I think he picks 100 players uh, and points out how each of these players is a physical freak. There are no Razorbacks on this. I think last year he had Traylon Burks. Uh, but there's uh, three Cincinnati Bearcats on this list. That's the same amount of uh, players on these freaks lists as Alabama and Georgia also has. So, I mean, you pointed out this Cincinnati team is returning the entire offensive line that started against Alabama in uh, the playoffs last year. They have a couple of the wide receivers with an incredible amount of speed. Got a tight end in Josh Weil, who has 4'6", 540 speed, and he's 6'6", 250. He scored six touchdowns last year. Look, I know Cincinnati had nine players that went in the NFL draft, including quarterback Desmond Ritter. They got a couple of quarterbacks that are battling for the position now and back up Evan Prater and Eastern Michigan transfer Ben Bryant. But when I look at the fact they've got every offensive lineman coming back and they barely allowed any sacks or pressures last year, and we're talking about Arkansas getting to the quarterback and trying to do a little more of that than we've seen in the last few years, it's going to be awfully tough in week one against Cincinnati. Yeah, I think that they're, they're probably will will just line up behind that veteran offensive line. Big guys, too. Uh, and just try to hammer away. You know, it, I'm not saying they can do that, but that'll be their first their first option. And uh, you know that Arkansas is going to do the same thing with their offensive line. And if you go back and watch what Alabama did, they just blasted straight ahead against them. I mean, it was five and six yards, and Cincinnati could never stop them. And they never brought the safeties up because they were so afraid of the the passing game. What what stands out as well when, when you look at this this uh, Cincinnati roster? I see juniors and, and seniors, juniors yes. and seniors, guys that have also had to wait for their opportunity no in question. some cases, just like you yep. see from Georgia, from Alabama. Yeah, I mean it's in in uh, first of all, I, the roster. I know that Luke Fickle is a, is a good evaluator, and and you know I've known about him for a long, long time. Um, one of my good friends, uh, my early days covering college football was John Cooper, was head coach at Tulsa. He went to Arizona State, then Ohio State. And Luke Fick- Fickle is a, is a John Cooper protege. And he, he's, we brought John in to, to do a touchdown club, oh, maybe, 12, 14 years ago, and we spent the day together. I drove him around town, took him over to see Coach Burles, and he started telling me about Luke Fickle, that he was uh, a defensive coach at, a very young defensive coach at Ohio State. He says he will be a great head coach, and he just couldn't stop talking about him. And he said he's he's a genius in how he constructs defenses, and, you know, he it's it's just been interesting to, to watch his development. So they've also got uh, Jim Trestle's uh, nephew. If, I'm, if I remember reading the, he is <laughs> the funny. defensive coordinator. This is really, this is really funny. My phone just rang and it says John Cooper. I texted him this morning. You know, we because I knew we were going to talk about Fickle in Cincinnati. And here is John calling me. So he's uh, obviously a daily listener to halftime. No, I mean, he, yeah, he. Of course, he's in uh, Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> well, hit that line dot com, right? You know. You yeah, I had to turn anywhere. the phone off, but uh, but I'll get back to him. I know it's going to be a great conversation. We, you know, I, he was he was at Tulsa, I guess, uh, 
the Tulsa World would have a seat on the Tulsa plane. So I flew, and he'd usually just sit down with me. Um, and we've always kept up. And, um, but I, I bet I get some really good stuff on Luke Fickle going into this. Because uh, I sent him a text. I didn't know whether he'd respond. Gosh, he's got to be in his 80s now. Do you have any sense that Aaron in Clarksville texts this in? Do you think that, and not the team, because I don't think the team will view it this way, but do you think like Arkansas fans are kind of looking past Cincinnati? No question. Bit? Yeah. No looking question. To South Carolina instead of no South question. Why is that? You know this is a good program. Oh, I just think it's just normal. I mean, it's uh, it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, it, and it'll it'll build to that game, and I think you know we'll we'll snap to attention probably two weeks out, but not yet. And it, I mean, there's I don't think Eddie is is too much different than a lot of other fans. That hey, we want to play Alabama, we want to beat them. We beat Texas A&M last year, but that's a big game too, and it comes before right. Well, you can't help but think about the losing streak sometimes. But Cincinnati is a huge game in my mind. There's no doubt. No doubt. I mean, you've got some incredibly tough non-conference games. Looking at, again, teams that All are in even their own in power way. five leagues now. Traveling to Provo. Hosting Cincinnati. Uh, you know, Missouri State FCS, but a good one. And could, be, could not be a tougher schedule in my mind. No doubt. All right. Into the third hour of halftime. Stay with us. This is for the men who never settle, the ones who miss the fairway all day and still pull out the big stick, the type of guys who will always prefer to be behind the grill than in front of the camera, and the men who never let their friends forget about a high school nickname. This is the Lodge mentality. This is Twin Peaks. Who wants to settle for a single TV? With more TVs, bigger screens, plus our fabulous scenic views, there's more to watch at Twin Peaks third hour halftime on this fine Thursday. It is Phil Elson along with Maddie T, Drew Barrett and Clay Henry with us for the next 30 minutes. We'll have uh, Grant Hall uh, on at the bottom of this hour get into some baseball stuff. And speaking of baseball, a crazy thing happened in Amarillo, Texas yesterday. Here is the call from the Springfield Cardinals radio network. 1-1 pitch. High drive. Right field. He just did it. Chan the Redman, four home runs in four straight innings. He just hit for the home run cycle for Springfield. This is uh, this is something Danielle Gibson did for Arkansas softball two seasons ago. It has never been accomplished in Major League Baseball. And the crazy thing about this home run cycle that Cardinals prospect Chandler Redmond uh, completed yesterday, it's happened twice in professional baseball history, both times. It's been a Cardinals player at Double A in the Texas League to pull it off. Tyrone Horn did the trick in 1998. He'd hit. He didn't just hit for the home run cycle. He hit. I guess you would call it a natural home run cycle. Which he did it in order: solo home run first, mm. two run homer second, three run homer third, then the grand slam in a game in San Antonio, Texas. I was not doing the games then, so I didn't see it in person. And, and then Chandler Redmond does it yesterday. I think he hit the solo home run third. But first of all, to hit four home runs in a game is nuts. To hit four home runs in four innings is even nuttier. For a home run cycle to happen, 22 years after it happened, the only other time, and it's the same league and the same organization, I don't know, a little bit mind-blowing to see that happen, even with the wind blowing out in Amarillo. That is such an accomplishment. It is, um, yeah. I mean, it's like it's like pitcher throwing three straight perfect games. You know, yeah. You just, I mean, I or four. Well, I mean, you've had four home runs. It's right? the kind of thing. It's just like you just never expect this could no, happen. Drew, I think uh, I've told you this. It's story. the rarest um, of unicorns. I, I worked in. I worked in for a single A team in 1995, a Tigers minor league team, and we had a pitcher named Scott Gardner who struck out five batters in one inning. He was learning oh, there's, there's a lot of drop one. third strikes. I'm guessing at yeah, least two. Well, the guy he was first of all he threw 94 miles an hour mm-hmm. when that meant something doesn't necessarily mean as much now. And he was learning a split fingered fastball, uh, which of course dives down. And he was learning it, but he was learning it to the point where the thing moved like a, a foot and a half, mm-hmm. and the catcher couldn't block it. So he struck out all five batters in the inning. Two 
wild pitch third strikes with the run, with the batter reaching base, um, and uh, it had never been accomplished before in baseball history up to that point. I was an 18 year old intern. My job at that point, I, I, I ran the stadium click effects and basically did anything they told me to do. Uh, and one of the things they told me to do was to go get a baseball signed by the batters who had struck out so we could send it to the Hall of Fame <laughs> and get a photo with them for the newspaper. These guys weren't all that fired up about it. But oh, I'm sure it. they weren't. No. <laughs> but they, they, People they want to be it. in the Hall of Fame for something that they did well, not for something that they didn't do well. Yeah. And striking, being a gr- group of five players to strike out in order in one inning, it's not really something you want your name on a plaque for. It's like some of these accomplishments. I saw somebody remind, uh, remembered an accomplishment by Mario Lemieux. Uh, we don't talk hockey very often, but he's the only player in NHL history to ever school, score a goal in five different ways. Even strength, power play, mm-hmm. shorthanded, penalty shot, and empty net. It's never happened before or since. Clay, what would be the football accomplishment of this? Like uh, mm. a special teams touchdown, an offensive touchdown, and a defensive touchdown. That's the only thing I can throwing, think of. Throwing, receiving, football. and rushing. I well, mean, that's well, the throwing, trifecta right there. Well, could, that would be a trifecta. Say, you could kind of go a step further. A punt return for a touchdown, a kickoff return for a touchdown, a running touchdown, a receiving touchdown, an interception touchdown, and a fumble return touchdown. That'd be the – that'd many, be the – how many different touchdowns was there? Was that seven? I think was that eight? Six. A bunch. Wow. Malik Hornsby could pull off the offensive triple threat here. The triple crown, couldn't he? Throw for one, run for one, and catch for one in the same game? Yeah, he could do that. Yeah. I think so. Uh, how about how about you throw a pass to yourself and score? <laughs> and that can We're happen, too. We now. saw him. Uh, I, I don't he did score, yeah. We saw that in the um, playoffs. Didn't Marcus Mariota do that uh, for the he Titans did. a few years ago? He did. Yeah, so in that case, he gets credit for the touchdown pass and the touchdown reception, I'm guessing doesn't so. He? That's a little bit weird. That is uh, definitely a little bit weird. Uh, anyway, this is just I did not base- think we were going to talk about hockey and Mario <laughs> Lemieux. Well, I was just bringing it up. Say it, say it for me. Lemieux. Lemieux. Yeah, so I'll teach you the French pronunciations of hockey players, and you can teach me that a fly shop is not a bait shop. Uh, I already and, did that. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm I, hopefully it sticks. Hopefully it stays. Sometimes yeah. it takes we'll, two or we'll three times to teach me something. Teach you the difference between uh, a nymph and a dry fly. I don't. Uh, so Drew the, knows. Drew obvi- Drew's looking at me like he thinks mm-hmm. he knows. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> no, I know. I know the difference. Yep. A nymph would be a wet fly that you'd fish underneath. A dry fly floats on top. And here it was, I thought nymph was a totally and, different and thing. That's kind of a misnomer because obviously if the dry fly is laying on the water, it's it's not dry, it's wet. Mm-hmm. I mean, it got wet as soon as it hit the water, but they call it a dry fly. Well, some it of it stays dry, top. yeah. I mean, you know, at least for the first gas, half of it's half it's on, on top. So I guess yeah, it, it could be half dry then. Jamie May just texted and just realized that Arkansas is not playing Barcelona. This is cr- this is really funny. Did Barcelona back out? I mean, I there's got to be a point that was this a forfeit, and they had to find a team that would come over to the pavilion because they're not they're playing in a pavilion today, not an arena. Did the Toto Estrellas have like a COVID problem or something? I or? don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm just this- disappointed. No Nick Calaitis. That's that's. I was really looking forward to that. I think this is kind of like you went down to the hyper in. Okay, who's there? Right. You, we're gonna play uh, shirts <laughs> right. and skins. Yeah, just pull a guy off the off it's the like court. A, you, 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 you. Yeah. Pull it off. Pull him off the court. See what he's got. And and still on the on the schedule page. And by the way, tip off for Arkansas and what is the team's name now that that K Wood sent us earlier? Um, here? It is uh, Catalan Elite, not spelled like Jalen Catalan. It's C A T A L A N Elite, Catalan and they, Elite. They, they, I mean, good luck they, finding anything online about no, them. I can't. It is for sure they're not elite. So all of you who did research on Barcelona Toto Estrella, it was completely wasted time. Mm-hmm. Drew, that's you. Yeah, yeah, I wasted a good 15, 20 minutes today. So, you yeah. know, it is what it is. But now I, now if I'm ever in, in a trivia contest and someone goes, hey, what was the last professional team Nick Nicolaitis played for? I know it's not the Grizzlies. It's this Barcelona Toto All-Star thingy. Well, I mean, so you're not going to be doing I did learn lot. something. I know that, that Muss and the coaching staff are just in, incredibly good at, at scouting opponents. I mean, in this case, I hope they didn't do any scouting of the Toto Estrellas because then it's completely wasted time. I'm, I'm guessing they didn't scout them. I'm, 
That's my guess, too. If you're frolicking on, in the ocean and running sets on the beach uh, five hours before tip-off, chances are you didn't scout the opponent very much either. <laughs> Uh, so I wonder if uh, Orange One Basket Bassano is going to play against Arkansas on Saturday or the Back and Bears on Monday because those are the two games they've got left. Yeah, and Jamie May's upset because he bought dumb, he brought, as he calls it, dumb flow sports just for this game. Because <laughs> he thought this might be the, the, the good one, the, uh, the prime game. I mean, these are the only games Good they've got right. on the schedule yeah. page. So does that mean later on in the season when Arkansas is scheduled to play against Auburn that we get an email earlier, uh, early that morning that instead of Auburn, it's the Troy Trojans that they're playing that day? No. Probably not. This is just a little bit weird. And again, Zimmerman does not have, Matt Zimmerman does not have a roster with numbers and names on it. It's got names only, no numbers. So how the heck does he know who's who? I think he still one. talks plenty fast. <laughs> he might be doing the game so, alone. Just guess. You just mix them up. Hopefully you get or get it right. And, but then again, I mean, how many people in Spain that know this team, would know the roster, know the number order, is going to be watching Flow Sports? Well, There's going to be a – I guarantee you there will be at least one dude named Juan. <laughs> it's probably a that's good, good guess. That's a, that's a, that's a good guess. Um, just like you would Maybe expect. Maybe a Santos. There might be a Michael on, on every American basketball team, but I don't know if there would be or not. Uh, text coming in here. 479 reminds us Joe Burrows threw a pass uh, and bounced up in a, for a touchdown in high school. So I guess he did that in high school he did at do one that, point. Yeah. Calvert asked about left tackle. We forgot to ask uh, you this question, Clay. Left tackle is the yeah. only open spot right now, theoretically, on the offensive line. Who do, who do you think emerges from that battle? Yeah, I mean, there. I think he's got to do it, you know, through camp. But I think it's it's Luke Jones's position right now, and I think they felt really good about what he did in the spring, and the way he worked in the summer and his strength level and explosiveness and the things that he's done. I mean, they they do everything but practice in the summer. I mean, they 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 uh, they see him and. You know the strength coaches you know, are able to get him to do things. I, mean, I think you know Devin Manuel will Manuel will be somebody that pushes him, but I, I don't see him beating him out. Uh, Sam continues to say Tykeus Crawford is going to play right tackle or right guard. It, it's it's really good for a young player to concentrate on one side. Uh, it's the way you position your feet, your drops, and your sets. You've got to reverse it when you, say, go from right tackle to left tackle. You know, an older player that's played some and has gotten a lot of reps, that's easier done. But I think I think you'll see Crawford, you know, spell Wagner and, and probably Bo Lemmer on the right side. Um, so, but I, they, they are really pleased with Luke Jones. So I think if that's the guy. Well, there you go, Calvert. You got your answer to that question. We'll probably be seeing Luke Jones at left tackle for Arkansas at least week one against Cincinnati. Clay's with us for one more segment. We are brought to you by our friends at Pradco Fishing. Uh, you might be doing some cold water bass fishing in the future. Make sure you got the umbrella flash mob junior with you. Best lure for duplicating a small school of shad. Work it from the top of the water, call them down to the bottom, and you can win all sorts of bass tournaments or just whoop up on a bunch of white bass and stripers. The Umbrella Flash Mob Jr. is available at lurenet.com and tackle stores all over the place. Got a call, got a text, 877-377-6963. More after this on Halftime. Eastside Liquor has more than just liquor. They also have wellness products and now carry Marley CBD gummies. They come in amazing flavors like Island Punch and Coconut Vanilla. They come in 200 milligram tin packs, so stop by 9390 Rogers Avenue and pick some up today. Now, back to the podcast. Our last segment here with Clay Henry on Halftime. And uh, the questions keep coming in here. Aaron in Clarksville, I think, has a, has a good point. He says, people have it in their minds that the rebuild is complete at Arkansas and everything's downhill from here. He thinks they're a good team, but he says people better harden their hearts because there will be at least one or two games that will surprise us 
just like we surprised other teams last year. I think that's I think that's a legitimate concern uh, by Aaron in Clarksville. It was Arkansas that kind of took some teams by surprise last year. I think A and M in that case maybe. Um, Texas certainly. There could be it could be the other way around in some cases too. And so much of it comes down to like what happens in the really close games. I think we talked about it on Monday. Arkansas was 0-3 in games decided by three points or less in 2020. 2-1 in games decided by three points or less last year. So often the season comes down to, is say games decided by one score? How about games decided by three points? And you just never know which way they're going to go. That's no question. It's true. And, I mean, uh, I keep going back and you look at, the teams on their schedule and the coaches and it, just terrific coaches all through here and you know I have great respect for Bobby Petrino and Luke Fickle is I mean he's he's a known quantity there is not any doubt that he knows how to build a team and there is continuity in that program more than than at Arkansas and you can say what you want about Cincinnati's path to the college football playoff but in my mind they earned it and they lost some great players, but they have they they have continuity in their program, and I guarantee you that Cincinnati thinks they're coming in here to win. Ryan in Prairie Grove on hold here. Hey Ryan, you're on halftime. Thanks for the phone call. What's up? No, I'm a, uh, I'm in Hot Springs. Oh, Hot Springs. Uh, oh, no, you have a Ryan question. in Prairie Grove on the text line. Sometimes, my bad. No, you good. Uh, so my question was, y'all were talking about the triple crown for. Uh, for football, my question would be: it kind of got to thinking, how many triple crowns you'd have to be to uh, or get to uh, put you in the Heisman race? I wonder. I'm kind of wondering mm. too what the uh, what the uh, triple crown record would be. Triple crown record is me- meaning like curious. meaning like th- throwing for a touchdown, receiving a touchdown, right, and, so and and rushing for one in the same game. Is that what you mean? Right. So hypothetical. Uh, what? Because the way we're going to use Malik, say he gets. Three triple crowns this year, plus has a decent amount of uh, receiving yards. Would that put him in the Heisman? I don't know. I, if I'm re- I don't know if I'm ready to to, to talk about um, a, a wide receiver who's <laughs> just getting a, a a package of plays for him. That doesn't mean he's going to be on the field enough. Um, oh, I just don't okay. see. I think you miss. I think you misunderstand what I'm trying to. Do. I'm not trying. I'm just trying to throw a hypothetical out there. I'm just trying to. Understand, I guess I'm posing that question to kind of get to see how big a deal. The triple crown. Like, is. how big of a deal is, is this? To... Sure, yeah, now I understand right. what, you, what you mean. Like, I yeah. mean, it's cool. Right. It feels really rare. It is cool, but, um, I mean, unless you do, <laughs> uh, unless you find a way to uh, to, uh, to to throw for, I mean, if, if you do this in two games, it's going to be something that gets a little bit of attention, but it's never going to be enough to get you inserted no. into the talk about a Heisman. Right. Okay, uh, just tell you how you win the Heisman. First of all, your team has to be really good. Yeah. Right. And then the, if you're doing something really unique for a really good team, and that could be a lot of different things. It could be running back. It could be quarterback. It could be a quarterback that plays some wide receiver. It could be that. But if Malik Hornsby scores 30 touchdowns and Arkansas is, you know, 11-1 and one and playing in the SEC championship game, yeah, he's in the Heisman contention. I mean, it, you know, but it – I would think that it's going to be...